the logic of mediation, the logic of negotiation, is you're not going to arrive at a perfect peace. You're not going to get everything, but what you can get by compromise might be better than what you can get through this endless cycle of violence. A critical mass of people in Israel and Palestine may have realized that the pain of compromise is sometimes less than the pain of war. Hello? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you, yes. How are you today? Not too bad. Busy, busy times. Well, if you're good to go, we're, we can get started. Yeah, yeah, no, no, with pleasure. Can you hear me all right? Hello, President Santos, how are you? Very well, how are you? Very good, it's wonderful to meet you. I'm David Harland. I'm the director of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, which mediates in war and peace. To all those who have felt that in war, there sometimes just has to be a way to find the lesser evil, I thank you. We wanted to speak with you about the mechanics of peace, about where a process, a peace process begins. What typically, if there is a typical, is your first step? The first step is often an idea. Sometimes it dawns slowly. The white South Africa regime in South Africa originally engaged the African National Congress with the idea of dividing the black majority in order to be able to continue its rule. De Klerk came to the conclusion that actually making an agreement now made more sense than fighting it out. Either the idea comes from the realm of reason or it comes from the realm of bloody experience and, and, and grows slowly. Did you say bloody experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's when you know, the cost of war becomes too heavy that the more rational elements of the parties to the conflict decide that a compromise is, is necessary. Does a conflict need to reach a particular point of violence or insecurity to get people talking? What's the motivation usually? There is what I sometimes refer to as the oh shit moment, you know, the, the moment where one side, usually the dominant side, says, you know, it's, it's not going to work. It will inevitably create so many civilian casualties and so much violence that it will make the problem worse. Saturday afternoon in Oma, the busiest day of the week. A home video camera records the horror. It was just a battlefield. People screaming, people uh, running, looking for their children, looking for their mothers. The Northern Ireland peace process reached its maturity at, at the moment of the Omar bombing. One of the most horrific experiences. And it's out of the crucible of suffering that the impulse towards compromise and peaceful coexistence will live. I, I, Will, will emerge. Come on! I feel an anger that this would be done, but I feel mostly numb and sickened. And I think it's also very important that those who are involved in building peace dig deep and continue. My name is Mary Robinson. I'm the former president of Ireland. Currently, I'm chair of a group of former leaders called the Elders. We work for peace and human rights and a sustainable world. I wonder if you could speak to what it took for the sides involved to be ready for peace. What was it that motivated people to actually think, yes, I want to sit down and start talking? Well, as Nelson Mandela said, you make peace with your enemy, not with your friends. I certainly think that people were very tired of the killing, the kneecapping, the destruction of property, the fear, all of that. Good Friday, 
a holy day for both Catholics and Protestants, and today many hope the beginning of a new era in Northern Ireland. Brilliant, brilliant altogether. Just a good day. Please. Over the moon, yeah, thank God. Trying to solve 30 years of troubles came down to this, a long, agonizing negotiation for peace. Today is about the promise of a bright future, a day when we hope a line can be drawn under the bloody past. It is a remarkable document, the, the Good Friday Agreement, and a good deal of it was the civil society and women's groups arguing for the structures of peace building inside the agreement. I believe that all <laughs> um, peace agreements uh, would come about more and more quickly if women were involved. Um, I, I believe that very firmly. My name is uh, Juan Manuel Santos, I'm from Colombia. I was a former president. I negotiated with the most powerful and oldest guerrilla movement in the Western Hemisphere, the FARC, which have been at war for more than 50 years. I had never lived in my country in peace. I have been seeing war uh, for, during all my life. I had this conversation with Mandela. Uh, I, I arrived, I turned on the South African television, and I saw the most surreal live program. We will thereby contribute to the healing of a traumatized and wounded people. The victims and the perpetrators were meeting and some of them cried, others screamed, and I said, what the hell is happening? <laughs> and uh, that afternoon, I had a meeting with Nelson Mandela. He started explaining how important it was to heal the wounds of the war. Mandela said, listen, you in Colombia, you must make peace if you want your country to take off. I understood that my port of destiny after my conversation with Mandela was trying to seek peace for my country. Forgive me for, for asking such a um, so simple question, but, but how does it begin? Like, did you pick up the phone and call? So we started in a process of building trust. For example, I sent my brother, I sent him as my personal envoy. Uh, they could have kidnapped him, they could have killed him, but they interpreted that as a real gesture uh, and, a, and a show of trust. Making war is rather easy. In war, you rally the forces around you and uh, you go after your adversary. Making peace is a completely different. You have to persuade and to persuade a mother whose daughter was raped and killed to accept a special legal treatment of the perpetrators is very difficult. And at the end, they said, but, but President, persevere, continue, go for the peace. And I said, why are you so generous? And many of them said to me, because we don't want others to suffer what we have suffered. And for me, that was a lesson in life. There is no total truth and there is no perfect justice and there's no perfect peace agreement. Are you able to draw from your experiences that perhaps taught you the greatest or the most useful lessons about peacemaking? I started my life as a mediator in Bosnia during the war. As Serbs advanced, punching their corridor through the field of thorns, entire towns were set ablaze, even where there'd been no fighting. The people of Srebrenica and their leaders agreed that the population could be evacuated to safer territory. Now, eventually, that was refused by the international community. It was decided that nobody should be allowed to evacuate because evacuating them would be complicity with the crime of ethnic cleansing. And those people are dead. I was sent by the United Nations to try to understand what had happened in Srebrenica. I arrived at this agricultural warehouse. I decided to 
poke my head in the door, I realized that the four walls and the ceiling and the floor were caked with human remains. Seven or 800 people, and then fire had been directed through all the windows and doors, and their bodies had physically exploded. These were people who died because the rest of us said that you shouldn't compromise on your principles. But, you know, somehow the lesson it taught me is that the highest principle of all is the right to life. That's the measure, isn't it? It's for people to be able to live quietly and freely and... and... First, ask the people who are about to die. And if they say, I would like to live, and then I will pursue according to my conscience. It's not the only measure, but it's the first measure. The idea of inventing peace. I wonder when you look at what's, what people have gone through on both sides, whether you could imagine the victims on both sides being willing or able to engage as allies of, of, of a peace endeavor. There is a sense that this one is different, that the two communities have just proven to each other that they have an almost unlimited capacity to inflict on the other the most horrible suffering and, and fear. But I'm modestly optimistic that the sheer horror of everything that's happened since October the 7th has reawakened the sense that a political settlement is not only possible, but necessary. <laughs>